I'd just like to welcome you all to the Lunch and Learn. Today is also Valentine's Day, so I hope you all love this tour. My name is Kathy Cho. I'm a Leon County Master Gardener, and I love to grow tomatoes. Today I'll be your guide as we explore tomatoes. Some stops on this tour will include seed and plant selection, sowing and starting your own plants, growing conditions, optimal growing conditions, which we live in Texas, so you know that can be difficult, fertilization, and along the way there may be some road detours. We're gonna talk about disease and pest control, and last but not least, I'll provide information for shopping and dining. Everyone likes to shop, and everybody likes to dine. Does this sound like a fun excursion? Okay, are you ready? Let's go. Tomatoes were introduced in North America by the Europeans, but they did not gain widespread popularity until the 20th century. Today, tomatoes are grown commercially all over the world. Botanically, the tomato is a fruit. Technically, the fruit is a berry. It forms from the flower of the plant and typically contains seeds. Some varieties of tomatoes have very little seeds and some varieties are full of seeds. May of 1883, the Supreme Court ruled that the tomato was a vegetable much to the annoyance of botanists even today. Would you agree, Noveline? Okay, so successful seed starting. I use this growing media. It's a very good seed starter. It's inexpensive. You can get it in the big box stores and in the feed stores. So first you have early growth. Your first 25 to 30 days after you plant that seed, a little seedling is going to pop up. It's going to be about this big. After about 20 to 25 days, you'll get your first true leaves. 20 to 30 days later, it should start to flower. 20 to 30 days after that, you should have fruit formation. The fruit comes after the flower. And in 15 to 20 more days, you should have mature fruit. Here's your little seeds. Here's when they pop up. Here's your flower. Here's your little tomato. Here it is ripe. And there's different degrees of ripeness. In the beginning, they're green. And then they call them breaker when they first start to have a little bit of pink. Technically, you can pick those at that time and put them in a windowsill and they'll ripen. Before the birds get them. Yeah, before the birds get them, exactly. And then they turn more pink and then they get pink and the light red and finally red. But nothing's better than to let those tomatoes ripen on the vine. Sometimes I play with nature and think, oh, I'll leave it out there one more day, hope the birds don't get it. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. So six to eight weeks before the last frost date, you're, you start your seeds with the heat mat, you know, warm temperatures increases your germination. This seed starting container, what I do is I cut this first row of slots off. It fits perfect inside this container. And I pour my starting media in a bucket and I add warm water to it and mix it all up. It tends to float until it gets good and saturated. And then I fill my little sections, put a seed in each one. I only put one seed in these containers. Um, 
when I was at Bobo's a couple of weeks ago, they have a seed starting tray that is the, the little sections are like this big. I told Kim, I said, oh, that would be perfect because it would fit in here and you could start twice as many seeds in one container. I had the lid on here so you could see how it creates condensation. There's a heat mat in the bottom. We've cut a little hole right here and we've cut some little slots and we've added chain on these fluorescent lights. And you can put this chain all the way down so it's like this far above your little seedlings when they first germinate and break that soil. Once they break the soil, you can take the lid off. This creates a really good, moist environment for those seeds to germinate. Some people even soak their seeds before they plant them. I don't do that because I create the environment within. These are my babies. These I started on January the 18th. I've tried to give them optimal growing conditions. They've got warmth, they've got moisture, they've got light. And to be successful, you have to have all three. One variety that I'm growing this year, it's called Haasinator. There's a company called Haas. They're in Georgia, and Georgia is a leading state for agriculture. That's a hybrid tomato that I'm growing from them. It's not an heirloom, it's a hybrid. They sent these brochures, which hopefully you picked one up at the table. And they also sent um, this one right here. On the front of it, it describes how to grow big, juicy tomatoes. And on the back, it has Haas tomato growth habit charts, which talks about determinate and indeterminate varieties. So I'd like to thank them for sharing their knowledge with us. There's also some a and m Do you have the A&M Garden Guide? Mm -hmm. this, one. this one. Yes. This one right here, which is a good information sheet. You can always go to the Texas A&M website to access more info. And also on the table, there's only one copy of this, which is the recommended varieties for Leon County. And here's the tomato varieties listed on this sheet. So you'll be better able to make a choice when you go to buy your plants. Some, some are short, short growing seasons, some are longer. The smaller or the largest. Small ones don't take as long. Your big beef slicers, they take about 100 days. Always, I like to read the seed catalogs. They have every kind of variety you can think of. Some are not recommended for our zone, which is 8B. You can pass these around. And if nothing else, I always keep the baker seed because it's such a pretty catalog and it has a wealth of information. And then there's Johnny selected seeds. There's Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. There's Roar Seeds. And then, of course, any of you that are lucky enough to have the Texas Master Gardener subscription, 
There's a wealth of information in the Texas Gardener, this Texas Gardener magazine. And this month, which is January, February 2024, the Ten Commandments of Tomato Success. So if you can get your hands on this, it's real good information. So y'all can pass these around. My little clicker. Okay. okay, so back to the container. Once the seeds pop up, I remove the lid. The seedlings will reach and grow toward the light, and you can spritz the soil daily with the spritzer because you don't want to let them dry out. Keep your grow light, LED light, about an inch from the top of the plants, and as the plants grow, you can lift the light up. And if it's too high above your plants, like if I had this, up here to start instead of down here, they would grow long and thin and leggy and fall over, yes. So I move the light up gradually as they grow. When your first true leaves appear, it's time to transplant them into four inch pots. Those are transplanted already into the four inch pots. They went from this to the four inch. And, and that's. Did you use the same potting soil? No, no, I changed. I start them with the seed jiffy starter, and then I use composted with a lot of organic matter. Okay, so this will promote strong root growth. You don't want to stick that seed in a container that's this big and let it germinate and grow from there. The purpose of Going from this size to that size to the gallon is to create strong root growth. Every time you transplant it, you're putting that, so that plant into the soil up to these leaves. You're going to keep each time. It's going to get deeper and it's going to have more roots on it. Up to the fossil. True leaves up to the first set of true leaves. This will promote strong root growth and it'll create a strong foundation. It's very important at this stage. Like if you build a house, you want a strong foundation. If you don't create a good root system, your plant is gonna struggle. Keeping the seedlings warm during the day and slightly cooler at night. I leave the heat mat on and turn the light off at night. They need a 14, 15, 16 hours of light, and then they need that rest during the night. They go through a cycle. And of course, you know, in, in your home, in the evening, the temperature is a little cooler than it is during the day. So that helps the plant as well. So here's some little seedlings. These are from last year. I tried these little peat things, and I didn't really care for them. So I'm back to the old container. That's how they look when they first pop up. And then you see your first true little leaves right here. There's some more little babies. This is when they get transplanted into the four-inch pots. So after that stage, you can move them to a cart if you, if you have something available to you to do that. It gives it more room and lets those plants grow taller. Here's four-inch pots that are about ready to go into the gallon containers. And this is what they should look like when you put them into the ground. Now, this is like the middle of March. I, I like to get my tomatoes in by the middle of March. They need cool nights. They need warm days. 
Now, our weather is tricky. Last year, I looked at the 10-day forecast before I even put them in the ground. 40-degree weather isn't going to hurt them. 50-degree weather isn't going to hurt them in the night. It may slow them down some, but your 30-degree weather is what's going to hurt them. If it looks like the 10-day forecast is going to at any time drop into the 30s, I you kind of play it by ear as to what the weather forecast is going to be. Yes, Teresa? Are you cardening them off here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So every day, I'll. mine right now are still inside the house. I haven't put them out in the greenhouse because we're still having that 30-degree weather. Like two days ago, we had a little sheet of ice. When it's 40s and 50s, I don't. They're okay. They'll survive. So every day I bring them out. I leave them out all day long. And then when it's time to go to bed, right before it gets dark, I'll take them back in. But once I plant them into the garden, whether it be in containers or directly into the ground, if I see that it is by chance, oh, I missed that day, I'll cover them with something. They're still small enough where you can cover them. I'm not doing my tomatoes in the ground anymore because I can't physically do it. We've gone to container gardening. When we were gardening in the ground, we took these cattle panels. They're like five foot by 16 foot. They're smaller at the bottom. But then these grids right here, you can get your hands through it. When you utilize and put two panels like that, your plant will fall. And it's self-supporting. You don't have to tie them up, use stakes or anything. The panels do it for you. And you can reach your hands in there to pick your tomatoes. And then at the bottom, like if you might have a rabbit problem or something, they can't, you know, get slipped through those little grids. Now, in the containers, I put two plants per syrup tub. Now you're probably going to say, ooh, isn't that too much? It works. I promise it works. And I always put one or two bean seeds within that pot. These are green bean seeds. The reason I do that is because beans and peas, they pull nitrogen from the air, which in turn helps your tomato plant. You can use a peanut. You could put a peanut in there. You could put a fava bean. You could put a pea because they're all nitrogen fixing and they all help your plants. Just like when we have a thunder and lightning storm, nobody likes thunder and lightning. I don't like it, but your plants love it. They're getting their moisture and that lightning creates nitrogen that helps your plants grow. And here's the rows with tomatoes. And I put a, two cages in each one, and it, it worked really well. What are you using for a medium in your syrup pot? So what we did, you know, everybody has sandy soil here. We took a front end loader, loader of the sand, we took a front end loader of the mushroom mulch, and we raked leaves. Um, you wouldn't want to use walnut leaves. That would be absolutely be a no-no. But like your sweet gum and your oak leaves, those are hardwoods. And we mixed it all together. And it would be like a few shovelfuls of sand and then a few shovelfuls of mushroom mulch and a few shovels of leaves mixed together. You know, I can't say it was one third, one third, and one third because it just kind of varied and we filled them up. We filled the containers back in the fall full of leaves. They compressed. By February, there was this, the leaves had compressed down and there was this much left in the bottom. Then we mix leaves and 
sand and mushroom mulch and filled our containers up. I also, a couple years ago, because I like the hydroponics, Steve Ogden, are you doing hydroponic? Okay, so I tried the peppers and the tomatoes in the hydroponic. It worked, as you can see. The plants weren't real big. They didn't produce a five-gallon bucket full, but they did produce. And I used pool noodles that I sliced halfway and put around the stem of the tomato and of the pepper plant to support it for its growth. It works, but I want a big harvest. So when transplanting to the garden bed, leave the tomato on its side. So when I, when I put this into the next size container, of course, it's going to grow more. I lean it like this and just kind of tilt that up and bury it where it's laying down and just kind of the leaves peeking toward the sun that makes roots wherever that stem is buried, which creates your strong foundation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about fertilizing. Coffee grinds contain key, nu key nutrients needed by plants. They provide nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Coffee grinds are particularly rich in nitrogen. They also will alter the soil, make it more acidic, tomatoes and roses both like acidic soil. There's some forms over there and some little soil sample bags it's always a good idea to get a soil sample before you start your gardening. It'll tell you what, what's in it and what's needed, lacking. By using coffee grinds, you're also reducing your kitchen waste <coughs> by using those grinds. And they're very good for a compost pile, paper and all. Using onion skins and banana peels, that's rich in potassium, calcium, and iron, which helps your plants grow stronger. So you know when you peel that onion? I have a little square container on my counter. I put my coffee grinds in, and like banana peels and onion peels, you can actually mix it all together. I put cinnamon in my coffee ground. Is that going to hurt? Um, it probably helped because I think they're using cinnamon to ward off evil things like um, blight and mildew and soil problems that create disease for your plants. <clears throat> okay, so now we talk about secondary. We don't drink coffee. If you like coffee, what would you do? Just well, you could use, if you use, if you drink tea, you can use tea bags. You do the same. You talk about secondary nutrients. Plants need calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. This is a label from a jar of molasses. Molasses is calcium. It has some iron. It has some magnesium. Once again, your soil sample is going to tell you if you're, Soil is lacking magnesium. It probably is in this area because of sand. Most sandy soil is, does not have sufficient magnesium. So I'll, I'll just take a gallon jar, a gallon tea or milk jug, fill it up, add about two tablespoons of molasses to it, and I'll put some Epsom salt in it. If I have any coffee left, I'll pour that in there or whatever I have that's going to make nitrogen. 
How often? Okay. You can want you could water every day with it if you wanted. But your Epsom salt, it's magnesium sulfate, which is a form of sulfur. Is that correct, Noveline? It's it's a chemical, a chemist would know this, but it it it's a form of sulfur. So that helps your plants. And oxygen. Your plants need a sandy light soil. And sandy light soil is deficient in magnesium most of the time. Okay, so now let's talk about the numbers on fertilizer. Small, high, small is what's recommended for a fertilizer for tomato plants. And it's suggested that you feed them every seven to 14 days, high potassium at first, because that's what sets your blossoms and your buds and then in turn makes your fruit. And then you need to mulch to retain moisture. So your fertilizer numbers, your first number on your fertilizer is your nitrogen. Your second number is your phosphorus. Your third number is your potassium. Nitrogen gives you top growth. Phosphorus stimulates root growth. It sets your buds and your flowers, and potassium is overall vigor. Up, the first number is for upgrowth, the second number is down, third number is all around, up, down, all around. So your plants, they have growth above the soil, like your tomatoes and your peppers, they need the nitrogen. Root crops, potatoes, carrots, onions, they need phosphorus, and then all plants need potassium. And that's an easy way to remember it, up, down, and all around. Adding phosphorus to the garden organically. You can use bone meal, and you can use fish meal emulsion or fish fertilizer. Charlene loves fish fertilizer. I like the results from fish fertilizer but boy, does it smell. And a little bit goes a long ways. Your container of fish fertilizer will last you five seasons. Like Super Thrive? Uh, it's called fish fertilizer. Thrive, I think, has fish in, emulsion in it. So it's good for tomato plants, but it's not a complete fertilizer. It's a good as a starter solution for transplants or foliage spray, and it's a great nitrogen source. That's when you're using like your coffee and your Epsom salt and your molasses. It's very good for your little starters, and you won't burn your plants by using that, as you will if you use commercial fertilizer. Now miracle Grow is good to put in a sprinkle can and wet the foliage, you know, a foiler feeding. But you need to do that early in the day so it dries off quickly, you know, like say 11 o'clock in the morning. And then by one o'clock, everything's all dry and you're not gonna create an environment for mildew. Blood meal is the waste product from animal processing that's dried and granulated. And it doesn't smell too hot either. Um, and it's a quick release of nitrogen because as soon as that melts, it's providing nitrogen to the plant. Fish fertilizer, you would add, this is how, how far it goes. Two tablespoons to a gallon of water is full strength. If you're gonna use fish fertilizer for your little seedlings, you only want to use it at a quarter strength, which would be about one and a half teaspoons per gallon. It's very little. Personally, I'd use nit higher phosphorus instead of nitrogen for good root development. Nitrogen is for lush, green foliage, top growth. It isn't important until you get them in the ground to get that good top growth. Good root growth is the foundation of the plant. Start fertilizing four to six weeks or when the cotyledons, that's the little 
true leaves first appear and they fall off. These little pieces right here, see these are yellowing. These are starting to yellow right here. These will fall, dry up and fall off. And when they're that stage of growth, that's when you want to fertilize them. Choose the correct variety for your growing zone. We're in 8B. Our last frost date is March 1st through the 15th, somewhere in there. But we had thunder the other day, so we may get a freeze in April or at least a frost. And then our, our first frost is anywhere from November 1st to the 15th. But we've had frost before in October. So you just kind of have to watch a 10 day forecast to see what's on the horizon. Thunder. There was thunder. We had two days of thunder. Yeah, they, it's an old wives tale. Yeah, that's what they always say. And I've also heard too that when you have thunder and lightning in February that you get a hurricane in September or October. But I don't know that to be a fact. Okay, so open pollinated. When you have an open pollinated plant, you can sow those seeds. Open pollinated. You can sow the seeds from open pollinated tomatoes. These plants will be the same as the parent plant. Those would be heirlooms. That's great for seed starters. So how do you know if it's open pollinated? F1 stands for first generation, just like in the cattle business. An F1 is a cross bred animal. A cross between open pollinated seed varieties. Your supermarket tomatoes are all F1s. So if you plant that seed, you'll get a surprise. There's no uniformity. Or if you took a tomato from the grocery store, saved the seeds, planted them the next year, took a tomato from that plant, saved the seeds, planted it the next year, and so forth and so on for seven generations, then you would be back to the true original variety that you bought at the grocery store. But if you plant that seed from the tomato you get at the store, you may get little bitty, you may get little bitty tomatoes. They take the best of two parent plants and cross them to create your hybrid. F1s always have hybrid vigor. They're stronger than an heirloom because you're getting the best from this plant, parent plant and the best from this parent plant. And you'll get a bigger harvest. So if you buy an F1 plant, a hybrid, from the store, the feed store, you're going to get a lot of harvest off of that plant, more so than if you plant an heirloom. Now, with an heirloom, you're going to get better taste. So F1 in front of the name of the variety means it is not a stabilized seed. If it doesn't have F1, then it's open pollinated. So what's an heirloom? Well, the dictionary tells us that it's a valued possession of property that is passed down in a family for generations. We all have that heirloom from our grandmother or our great-grandmother. So what's an heirloom tomato? It has to be 50 plus in age and or been handed down for two generations or more and open pollinated. And over time, the trend changes, just like stylish clothes and hairstyles. Like these two years, you may wear this for fashion. You may wear your hair like this. But next year, things change. So did the tomato varieties. Um, I have this book. It's by Carolyn Mail. 100 Heirloom Tomatoes for the American Garden. It has all uh, a, a lot of the heirloom tomatoes. Cherokee purple, which is a good variety for our area. Brandywine. 
And then I'm actually growing this one this year, Amish Paste. It is like in the Roma family. And it's an heirloom. Y'all can pass this book around and look at the different varieties of heirlooms. Don't get the same volume of production out of heirlooms. No, no, but you get taste. You're sacrificing quantity for quality when you buy a hybrid. So heirloom seeds are passed from generation to generation, open pollinated, and they taste great. An added bonus, you can save the seed to plant the following year. Black creme, brandy wine, Cherokee purple, these are heirloom varieties. When you plant those and you harvest a tomato, you can scrape that pulp out and those seeds and you can save them to plant next year. Here's some seeds that I saved. Coffee filters work great. And if anyone's interested in saving seeds, a lot of times they'll ferment those seeds. And if you're interested in it, I'll be happy to talk to you about that process. Recommended heirloom varieties for AB, brandy wine, Cherokee purple, Amish paste. Now your hybrid varieties, better boy. Tomatoes come in all shapes, sizes, and colors and varieties. They're characterized by size, an heirloom or hybrid, determinate or indeterminate. Most hybrids are determinate. Most heirlooms are indeterminate. You have early maturing where it takes 50 to 68 days. Middle of the line would be 69 to 79 days, and late would be 80 to 95 days. The bigger the tomato, the longer it takes for it to grow and ripen. The recommended hybrid varieties for Zone 8B is Celebrity, Better Boy, Early Girl. Now, your cherry varieties are snack size right here. Your Roma varieties are for sauces and salsas. They have very few seeds. And then your big beefs, those varieties are for slicing. These are all my tomatoes. All the slides in here are my tomatoes. Good soil and fertilizer produces tasty tomatoes. Good soil is light and rich in organic matter. Using organic fertilizer grows a better tasting tomato. Miracle Grow has a container of fertilizer that is labeled for vegetables. Some is labeled for flowers, but they're getting smart. Some of, some of the Miracle Grow now is worm castings and more organic than commercial, like they used to be. Okay, let's talk about the true San Marzano. The lady in this room that grows the best San Marzano tomatoes, please stand up. Know we know who she is. <laughs> if you need any questions about San Marzano, Lisa will tell you. I'm going to give you a little history about the San Marzano because it comes from my part of the world. It's grown in Italy in the volcanic region of Sarnese, Norsinio, geographical region in Campana between Salerno and Naples. Have you ever gone there, Lisa? Okay. So Cento, this is the brand of San Marzano. These are true San Marzanos. They're grown in Italy. We have seeds that we plant that says San Marzano, but the Italian people will tell you those are not true San Marzanos because they're not grown in that region of the world. These tomatoes get their flavor from the soil that they're grown in. It's a lot of lava and volcanic ash in that area. These are certified, and they're $4.75 a can. Wow. So... Okay, now, 
with your fertilizer, your compost recipe, you can take rainwater or well water, molasses, worm compost or compost from the base of the trees in the woods. Like if you have a, if you have a forest, you can go out there and you can get that leaf litter and stuff that, that's around the bases of the trees. It's got living organism in it. The molasses is your sweetener, just like when you make wine. You have yeast and you have sweet sugar. That's what makes it ferment. And add Epsom salt to it to give it the mineral. You can ferment it several days. It'll smell sweet and earthy. Use this water to water your plants and as a foliage spray. There's this Dooley's own little Texas tea brewer that you can make. You can actually take a, a aerator for the fish tank or like if you go fishing, the aerator for your fish bucket and put it in there and that'll help keep it aerated and help it ferment and work. Uh-oh, we hit a detour, sorry. Detour, tomato diseases. Oh no, my tomato plant is sick. Yes. Well, you know what? I, I don't really know the answer to that. I just take it and I sprinkle it. I sprinkle it. Well, you can, if you're mixing it up in a gallon, probably put two tablespoons of Epsom salt and two tablespoons of molasses. Yeah. It, it's not going to hurt your plants. It's not going to hurt them. It is not the same composition as regular table salt. So many people think it is. It is not. Eggshells, they're good, but they take a long time to break down, and they pr only provide calcium. Oh my, my tomato plant is sick. What now? The tomato diseases. You get mildew. Mildew is created from hot, humid weather. Milk and baking soda, milk and baking soda spray. You can use one teaspoon of baking soda to three cups of water, and then add one and a fourth cups of skim or low-fat milk, or if you have powdered milk, or if you have canned milk. Milk provides calcium for your plant. The baking soda attacks the fungus the mildew. You spray your plants well, spray it early in the day. The maintenance spray, you can spray like once a month and that will help ward off any problems. So you could do, it's better to, to do that once a month and prevent the disease than trying to cure the disease. Prevention is easier. So, Remove the leaves that are affected, spray the plant, soaking it twice a week, sunny part of the day, and your mildew should disappear. Then you have late blight, and that's caused from rain. Your leaves turn brown and black leaves, usually near the bottom of the plant. You need to pull those off, and don't be putting that stuff in your compost pile, because you'd just be creating another problem. And blight, and mildew, it spreads quickly in hot and humid weather. And there's really nothing you can do to prevent the disease before it starts. So maintenance with the milk spray and baking soda works well. Yellow leaves on your tomato plants. You need to determine the cause. It could be low light. It could be watering, either too much or not enough. It could be a nutritional deficiency. Your soil may be lacking. That's where your soil sample comes in. And of course, you know the diseases. Yellow leaves should be removed to improve airflow and prevent the spread of disease. Then you get blossom end rot. That is a calcium deficiency and it's also caused from inconsistent watering. When you plant your tomatoes, if you wanna put a rollades or a tum in that hole, That'll provide calcium probably for the life of the plant. 
if I have leftover milk, if there's this much milk in the container, and y'all have heard me say this before, I just fill it up and water my plants with it. It's good for all plants. It provides calcium. All plants need calcium. Does it good or? No, we, I, I used, if, if it's gone sour, I, I, I still use it. Okay, so has anyone ever seen a tomato that looks like this? This is called cat facing. This was a tomato from last year that I grew. Cat facing, the most prevalent when pollination occurs during cool weather, and this cannot be prevented. Like, you remember last year how cool those nights were for so long before it finally decided to warm up? When the plants are pollinated during cool weather, it creates this. They're still edible. They just look funny. I think they look kind of cool myself. A lot of your heirloom tomatoes look like that, too, where they're naturally like cat-based. Okay, so then we have pests. Your common tomato pests are thripe, hornworm, aphid, stink bug, white fly, flea beetle, cutworm, spider mite. Y'all have had one of these at least in your years of gardening. The tomato hornworm. He has an appetite for tomatoes and is a frequent visitor to the garden. Generally, the whole fe they only feast on tomatoes. They camouflage well within your plants because they're big, fat, and green. Most of the time you don't realize they're there until you go out the next morning and you find all your leaves completely eaten. Yeah. That's, the, that's the larval stage of the sphinx moth. I get it right? <laughs> Got to look at it by... <laughs> they probably do. So the moth lays its eggs on the leaves and in about a week the caterpillar emerges. Three or four weeks, they attain full size, and then they travel back down the stem and the plant, and they bury, burrow back into the soil, and the cycle starts all over again. That's only if you don't catch them. So here's, here's a hornworm. Here's what they look like. They're big, fat, and ugly, and they have a little spike on the one end. The solution, hand pick them off. Chickens like them, and they're good fishing bait. So in nature, we have the braconid wasp. It lays its eggs on the caterpillar, that tomato hornworm caterpillar. And then the wasp larvae eat the caterpillar from the inside out. The braconid wasp is a beneficial insect in your garden. Yeah, he kind of, doesn't he have like fluorescent looking green looking bluish black? Itty bitty, yeah. Okay, so here's one right here. That poor hornworm, look what happened to him. See, that's, that's what it does. All these little white things appear on him. He's... Hey, tell, can you tell them? Can you tell them that? Can you stand up and tell them? What, what's happened there is the the wasp laid its eggs when the, on that caterpillar when the caterpillar was very small and has been eating the whole time. And about the time the caterpillar is full grown, so are the larvae of the wasp. So they'll come to the skin surface, cut a hole, crawl out. Make a little cocoon, which is the white part. And by this time, the, the caterpillar is kind of a zombie. <laughs> and the, the little white wasps will come out, one, one little tiny wasp from each one of those cocoons and fly away and look for the next generation of caterpillars. Yes. Nature's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so. These little spots right here, 
that appeared after a lot of rain. So you go oh, and you just pick that off. Oh, I cut that whole stem off. There's some San Marzano. There's a nice slicer. There's some salsa. There's some green beans. So sometimes when you go out into your garden, you don't have a lot of a certain vegetable. You can combine, you can combine your vegetables and cook them together. There's no rule that says you can't. Tomatoes, are, tomatoes and potatoes are first cousins. They belong in the nightshade family and like the same soil conditions. Blooms are very similar. Be sure to rotate your crops. Never plant your tomatoes in the same spot year after year or your potatoes. So beans are cousins. That's why they have the T-O-E-S. They have the same last name. Yeah. Yeah, they're cousins. They're the nightshade family. And the potato is edible, but all the green in the leaf is poisonous. The tomato... The fruit is edible, but the stalks and the leaves are poisonous. But if you grow in a container, are you saying don't use the same thing? Well, again? you're going to be, okay. When you fill your container, if you're putting a lot of like leaves, it's going to compost down. So you're going to be continually adding to it. When you container garden, you're in control. You keep adding to it. You're adding to it. So it, I'm going to put mine in the same because my, mine is like, it was once you're growing in the ground because you're depleting. So here is the bloom. This is your tomato. This is your potato. You see how similar they are? They both Go, grow down and then open. Actually, the potato blooms are really very pretty. Okay, I promised y'all we were going to go dining and shopping. So what do you do with all those tomatoes? You can make ketchup. You can make tomato juice and add it to other vegetable juices. You can make sweet potato jam. That's what I passed around. That's this right here. I used the sun gold tomatoes to make this. And actually, they were tomatoes. Like when your harvest is so big, you can freeze and go back later and can. Or make your jams or your jellies. That was sun gold, the sun gold, pear shape, paste looking tomatoes. They have very few seeds. You can use tomatoes when you make breads. Here's a, here's a pot with some zucchini and some onions and tomatoes. Put a lid on it, cook it, and serve it with other vegetables. Cook some rice, some noodles, whatever. You could add tomatoes to your baked macaroni and cheese, slice them and put it on top. You can make a salad with fresh homegrown greens. You can prepackage your tomatoes, onions, and jalapenos for salsa. You can actually, in those vacuum sealed bags, put that bag in a pot of boiling water. You're gonna retain your nutrients. And then once it's soft and cooked, you can tell by looking at the bag, you open it up, you put it in the blender, and there you have it. Just as good as restaurant style. Put it, or you can just take fresh onions, tomatoes, peppers. This is an easy way to freeze them. Once you cut them up, you know, they make a lot of juice. Well, if you do this first and then put them in the vacuum seal, it works better. 
So otherwise, you're sucking all that juice out. No, that's just, it, that's steam. Yeah, I cook them. Yeah. Well, I blanch them. I blanch them and pull the skins off. And then when I'm really lazy, I'll, like if I know I'm going to use them shortly, I'll freeze them whole. I don't blanch them. Then when you take them out and run them under the water, the skin peels right off. Also, what I do is I freeze individual tomatoes in the vacuum seal bag. When I take it out of the freezer, I'll run it, I'll peel it, and then I take the mandolin slicer and slice it frozen, and I put that on my salad. It makes it moist. It gives it that good tomato flavor because, you know, store-bought tomatoes in the wintertime have no taste, no flavor. I don't even buy them anymore. And when you do that with the frozen tomato, it creates enough moisture that you really don't need a salad dressing. So if you're living on salads for a health reason or otherwise, it's good, you know, and then you're not adding fat to it. And there's some that I canned. You can always freeze them, go back later, take them out and recan them. You can do dehydrated, sun-dried, stored in an airtight vacuum sealed container or bag. Some people I know, there's someone here, Dale, you have a freeze dryer, don't you? Have you ever done the tomatoes in the freeze dryer? Mm -hmm. Let us know how it works. You can dehydrate the skins to add to soup or stew. You know, when, when you're blanching and you have all this container of Skins, I put them in the dehydrator and dehydrate them okay. and then powder them. When you're cutting up your tomatoes to can, uh -huh. you always have bukus of juice left. Mm -hmm. I used to always save my juice, strain the seeds out of mm -hmm. it, but they work in the canner just like mm -hmm. tomatoes do, and I could use that stock for soup. Yeah, that's really good. And add it with other other vegetables. Yeah. Making soups or stews. I just realized what I need. Really and choke. You know? no. <laughs> I do good I do good to, to run my own I need a candy bag. But yeah. when you dehydrate these, I just vacuum seal them in these little packets and you can add these to soups or stews for added flavor, fiber, nutrition, because you know they say the best part of the is the skin. And all your fruits and vegetables. You can sprinkle this on salads, whether it be a green salad or a potato salad or a macaroni salad. You know, the, the, the options are limitless. You can make pizzas with them. You can make sauce for a crowd. When my kids all came at Christmas, I took about 15 bags of potatoes out of the freezer. And then I just added tomato paste, store-bought, to thicken it, and it makes a, makes a great sauce. And every day, every day, I pick loads and loads of tomatoes. And they don't, as you can see, they don't have to be fully red to pick them because they will ripen. And if you wrap them in paper towel or tissue paper or newspaper and put them in a box. You can stick them under the bed and they last a long time, especially if you pick them green. You can make a meat sauce with them. You can slice them and have them with the steak and potatoes. You can make tomato toast. I love tomato toast. Just put a little olive oil on that Italian bread, <coughs> a little garlic, and basil, and a slice of tomato, and some mozzarella cheese, and put it in the broiler. It's delicious. It goes great with the salad. <laughs> salsa, <laughs> fresh to can. Marinara sauce. Lisa's good at making that with all her San Marzano's. And then this is what I picked the beginning of December after our first freeze. My tomatoes went that long. I planted the Florida 91 and they produced all summer into the fall. 
they're not as big and pretty as they were in the beginning of the season. So at the end of the season, you can make fried green tomatoes. You can leave them and they'll ripen. You can make chow chow. You know, everyone always made chow chow with all their leftover garden vegetables, you know, at the end of the season. You know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. That is the biggest tomato that I ever grew in my whole life. What did what? That is the biggest I know, tomato I ever grew in my whole life. Do you know how much it weighed? No, we didn't weigh it. Wow. I should have. I what didn't. kind of tomato was it? It probably was a better boy, because I used to buy the big beef from better boy. Hmm. So I just want to thank you all for signing up for this tour, and we hope we'll see you on the next excursion.